uh, introduce Raji Grace, uh, who has been known to me for over 20 years now. Uh, and uh, the reason, of course, I know him is he and I work in the area of microsensors um, going back all this time. And of course, Roger is even longer in the area. Um, but um, I have met him in various uh, conferences over the years, and Roger has done some phenomenal um, uh, work in, in uh, essentially making sensors and sensor-related activities very popular um, across the whole country. And of course, he is an alumni of um, our university here, and um, um, currently, of course, lives in Florida, but from time to time, he is here. Um, and serves on very many important um, committees for the, the university um, uh, at this time. Um, and he uh, did his uh, undergraduate and his master's from Northeastern and then an MBA from UC Berkeley. Um, with that, um, I'm going to let Roger uh, take over and you know, give us his talk today on smart sensors. Thank you. So, uh, thank you very much, Steve, us for your kind uh, introduction. So, um, for, for those who had been to a similar lecture several years ago, I wanted to Okay, uh, so for those who've been, um, I would suggest there's some chairs here so people don't have to stand, please. Come and sit. There's a couple of chairs here, one there. Let's get friendly. We're all part of the Husky Nation here. So thank, thank, by the way, well, these, these guys are postgraduates because uh, <laughs> you know, they're like me. They got gray hair, no hair, you know, and uh, they're dear friends from the editorial world. Please introduce yourselves. Oh, I'm, I'm Rick Nelson. I'm, I'm the executive editor of a trade journal called The Evaluation Engineering. And I'm Mark Murrow. I'm the senior technical editor for two online publications. One is called EDN and the other is called ED Times. And I'm sure as, uh, as engineering students you'll be uh, reading these publications as I do because they are extremely valuable for those folks who are going to go out into the world and uh, be engineers and uh, you know, support uh, the engineering community. So as I was saying, uh, I gave a lecture similar to this several years ago, and this le this presentation has been evolving like most presentations evolve, and it's evolved as a result of some um, you know constantly evolving technologies that are being evaluated uh, and, and researched around the world, and. And the thing that I'm going to talk about here uh, and focus on is we're going to talk a lot about commercialization issues. I'm going to give a lot of examples of, of, of these printed flexible functional fabric uh, sensors. But the focus is not going to be on the sensors themselves. The focus is going to be on what I call the commercial commercialization issues. How do we get, to, and this is what I do for a living, how do we get a technology from a laboratory like here at Northeastern or at Berkeley or at Michigan or Stanford or MIT or any of those places, how do we take technology from the lab and bring it to the fab? I call it the lab to the fab process. And we're going to talk a lot about what are the challenges in bringing technology into the marketplace. So you, know, you kind of have a, an idea of what, uh, what we're going to talk about here. And I'll be giving... I'll be giving several um, examples, but again, we're not going to spend a lot of time on that. But we're going to talk about things like, I call it, money makes the world go around, right? Like the famous song in 
be famous. And, and Martin and everybody, you can have a copy of this. Thank you. You don't have to use up all the memory in your in your cell phone. <laughs> Thank you. So Thank you. you know, you guys especially, you got to get a copy of this. <laughs> so okay, and anybody else that wants a copy of it, uh, I will I will leave it up to somebody here. John, would, would, would you would you like to be the person that that collects the names of people that want a copy of this? Can I give you that as I've a responsibility? A I'm sorry. I've got a flash drive. Yeah. Never leave, never never leave without it. Oh, I have to. So, okay. So, John, in terms of getting names and, and emails of people, if people if people want a copy of this, John, hey, Mike, John, Mike, I'm sorry. Yeah. No. I, I didn't know who you were talking about. I thought maybe John was. I'm talking about John Velakis. I'm sorry. I'm, I got John Velakis. <laughs> Mike, Mike Boris. Does anyone know Mike Boris? Hi, everyone. Mike. Mike Boris. So Mike, Mike, Mike's the guy. So I apologize. No, okay. I, I owe you. A beer. I thought maybe John was standing behind me. I owe you a beer. <laughs> so he'll he'll take your name. So anybody who wants this, just let me know, and I'll send you a copy of it. So the thing that's going to be important here is these things here: critical success factors, monetizing, how to make money out of technology. Hope hope this is disappointing because I know most people most people are entrepreneurial in nature, and we're going to satisfy your entrepreneurial spirit. Now this is, this is not uh, uh, an eye test, although some people may think so. And when I give presentations, people tell me, because they want to be nice to me, that my presentations are too text rich. Meaning, there's too many words. It's like, it's like that movie, Amadeus, when, when the prince tells Mozart, too many notes here, Mozart, too many notes. Too many words, Mr. Grace, but that's the way it is. So I'm not going to go over that because you saw that in the announcement. The thing that's important here is that, as, as uh, Jeannie Voss mentioned, that I did spend a lot of time at this school. I was very blessed to have been able to be a Raytheon fellow in graduate school. Raytheon was, was kind enough to send me to California upon my graduation in 1969, and I've been in Silicon Valley and, and uh, since 1969, and uh, have uh, and did uh, very interesting uh, 1990 to 2003 adjunct faculty uh, position at UC Berkeley, where I taught a course on not electromagnetic wave propagation, which was my area of expertise, but on business plans. I taught it in the engineering school, and it was an entrepreneurial course, and. Uh, also, I am on several boards at the university and, uh, and was, in fact, the alumni of the year in 2004. So, um, my organization uh, is a marketing organization, and our area, in our area of expertise, and I happen to like this slide, our area of expertise is here, here, in here. We do a lot of market research. We go out and we talk to people, listen to the voice of the customer, understand what their needs are, go back to our clients and say, here's what we see that this product definition should be like. This is what other people have. And if you want to be successful, we put this through like a, a signal correlator and we figure out exactly what this product needs to look like. Then it goes into the design manufacturing process. And then when it comes to go to the marketplace, we do a whole bunch more uh, market analysis. And then after that's done, we end up launching the product into the marketplace. So there's a lot of marketing that needs to be done in bringing the product to market, to the market in, in, from a uh, commercialization point of view. So this is a little, a little background on what, what the content of this presentation uh, comes from. Uh, I've conducted 65 interviews to, uh, 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 for this presentation that you're going to see. And uh, this has happened since uh, I started collecting data in 2015. And in addition to that, I've done some data mining, but the majority of the information here comes directly from the interviews that I've conducted. The most important reason, uh, the most important reasons why printed, flexible, 
stretchable functional fabrics are important is what I tried to depict here with my little Venn diagram. And, and if you look at the rationale, the benefits. There's a cost benefit and a functionality benefit, as you can see here. So if you look at these different concepts of printed and, and stretchable and flexible and fabric, and you look at the, at the benefits of adopting these technologies here and here, you can see that although cost is an important issue, the real driving factor here is the functionality and the application especially in the area of wearables. Wearables are, in my opinion, the most important market driver for the success of these technologies. And we all know, because we all, I can see some people have them on their wrist, and who knows what else they have, but wearables are really, really a major market driver and will continue to be a major market driver for years to come <coughs> as we, we uh, want to know more about our physical condition. Uh, and Fitbit is only the beginning. Fitbit, uh, as you know, came out several years ago and people are more interested not on how many steps you've taken and how many calories that can equate to through some algorithm but they want to be able to measure a number of physiological phenomena like dehydration, very important, dehydration, uh, and they want to measure it either on your wrist or even better, on your t-shirt. T-shirts are better than watches, right? Because uh, a lot of reasons. So there are people that are in the, the, new, the, new, the new wave, and I'll show you the waves, the new wave is trying to make these sensors invisible to a person that's wearing them, just like you put on a pair of socks, or you put on a t-shirt, or you put on a hat, or a running shoe. It's something you gotta do anyways, not put a Fitbit on your wrist. So, so that's why this idea of fabric is really, really important. What are the commercialization driving functions? As I mentioned earlier, I think the mere fact that these things are conformal, they are basically, they're low profile, they're lightweight, they typically can be made very inexpensively, and I'll show you a slide that depicts this, one of my, my colleagues gave me this slide, Two orders of magnitude less expensive than silicon. And, and my dear friend Svidavas is a guy who spent a lot of time working on silicon. Silicon's not dead, Svidavas. We we'll always need silicon. But the fact of the matter is, a lot of the functionalities that silicon has taken over are losing ground to other platforms. And I'll talk about these platforms. The other thing that's really interesting, and, and uh, Ahmed Buzdanya, my dear friend Ahmed, who's a medical engineering guy, who's not here today, but Ahmed's team has been doing a lot of this stuff, and Ahmed is in the process of launching a company to make printed biosensors. And one of the things that's interesting is if anybody here has been in the semiconductor business, we know how much it costs to build a semiconductor fab. It's immense, it's truly immense. It's like billions of dollars, that means 10 to the ninth. People can do this kind of sensor technology for hundreds of thousands of dollars, which makes the barrier uh, to entry to small companies so much more advantageous. Now, this is an area that I have really been pushing for the last 10 years and I'm seeing it becoming very much accepted and that is sensors by themselves in the front end can't do a lot until the signals that they pick up through some phenomena whether it be electro-optical, electrochemical, electro electromechanical like a like a pressure sensor or an accelerometer, has to have signal conditioning. 
signal conditioning mm -hmm. will add certain things like filtering, like amplification, like A to D conversion. So you can start moving into making sensors smart. Sensors that are smart basically are sensors that have microcontrollers in them that can understand what inputs are coming in and using algorithms can uh, provide information from raw data. For companies to be successful moving forward, and this is well, this is not just Roger Grace talking, this is everybody in the industry, you can't be here. You need to add value, you need to add functionality, you need to add vertical integration to the sensor technology. And this is going to be a key element in any companies moving forward in this area. You're not going to be successful by just having a sensor. You need more than a sensor. I call it smart system solutions. And, and smart system solutions are ones that bring in more than just a sensor. They bring in other functionalities, including smart. Smart basically means microcontroller. There's a lot of benefit to this. Whoa. So, you can see, we're not going to spend a lot of time on this, but you can see the most important thing is if suppliers benefit and users benefit to that degree, this is going to happen in the world of commercialization when both parts of the equation see benefit to adopting a certain basic concept. I put together this slide to, to demonstrate where I see the evolution of this technology, these two technologies, printed flexible and functional fabrics to be. If you look back, I consider this curve the discrete mechanical curve. These are discrete mechanical sensors that are made from individual parts, like it could be an LDDT, which is kind of a magnet, uh, a magnet and a coil. They move kind of independent uh, uh, and, and um, you can determine flux and determine position and a whole bunch of other things. These have been around for a long time. MEM sensors, uh, starting with, uh, <coughs> bless you, bless you, with Charles Smith in his Journal of Applied Physics or Applied Physics Letters in 1955 was the beginning of MEMS. MEMS have gone through a cycle, growth, maturity, and decline. You know, MEMS, MEMS are still moving very, very nicely, and the thing that's propelled MEMS has been these. There are 12 to 14 MEMS devices in the uh, Samsung S9. I was looking at them yesterday, pretty impressive piece of equipment, and in the uh, Apple 10. I think there are 12 to, 12 to 15. However, I submit that we have two new platforms. These, these are platforms. This is a silicon platform. This is a printed, flexible, plastic or paper platform. And then we have a fabric platform. As time goes on, we're going to see, and this is a commercialization process, we're going to see more and more work and more and more people getting involved with making things out of this technology. And simultaneously, we're going to see a ramp up here. So this is what we can see going forward in terms of adoption of technology. Um, the thing that's really important from a, from a commercialization point of view is that you need to have an infrastructure. Commercialization cannot happen in, that, in a vacuum. You need to have packaging. You need to have interconnects. One of the most important things in the sensors world, and I know Svini Vas will agree to this, is packaging. Right? Packaging, packaging typically consumes more of the bill of material than the sensor does, or the application-specific integrated circuit signal conditioning electronics. Packaging is critical. Packaging is the thing that will help these sensors survive in the environment that you immerse them in. So packaging, and the other thing is with these, these technologies, integrating them, and we'll talk more about this, integrating them into a system and interconnecting them. So once they're interconnected and they're on a body, and the body is being uh, or they're in a washing machine, 
give you a good example of that one, that they can survive being washed a hundred times. I was out at uh, Flextronics out in San Jose uh, last year uh, with, the, with the board of, uh, of trustees, and we were hosted uh, at that facility, and we were taken through a two-hour tour. I've been, I've been in the uh, military aerospace business for many, many years, and we had all kinds of environmental test laboratories. We would put satellites on shaker tables and do things like that. But what do they have at Flextronics and their environmental test lab? A Maytag washer and a Maytag dryer. I was at the Natick lab at the U.S. Army facility, and they had a washer and dryer, but they weren't Maytag, or they were they didn't have Maytag in the front. They were this big and this big, and they were washing military uniforms. These sensors have to survive very tough environments, including 100 washes at 140 degrees Fahrenheit, and dryers at high elevations and they have to do it a hundred times and still have to work. So this is the key, Integrate, interconnects, packaging, and integration. Very important. I'm not going to talk a lot about market, market figures, but um, that there are several companies that are coming up with these numbers, and it's hard to really sort through them to make any heads or tails out of them. But one company in general, um, is called uh, is called um, ID Texex. That th this week they are having their annual conference in Berlin, Germany, and in the fall in Santa Clara. They've come up with uh, several reports. Uh, however, I think the reports are somewhat misleading because uh, they include these little test strips for uh, blood glucose in, in their in their big 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 numbers. They're, they're saying uh, like eight eight billion dollars. So you know, we're not going to spend a lot of time on that, but the point is, this technology is moving rapidly. Um, here's a summary of some of the reports that I've done, but you know, my point is, watch out when you buy these reports. Um, there's something to be learned about them, but they, they should be uh, used for uh, for uh, uh, for guidance. But uh, don't bet the farm on them. What's really important is this uh, graph I got from Lux Research here in Boston. It shows a very early indicator of the importance of a technology, and it's patents. When you see people pulling patents, and look at, look at this. This is like an exponential. This is an e to the x curve. This is really, really impressive to see what kind of patent applications are going on right now in textiles. <clears throat> this tells me that this is something to keep our eyes on. What are the application opportunities? You know, we, we, we talk about technology, technology, technology. How can these things be used? Well, there's a lot of them being used right now in various applications. Uh, thin film. Scandinavian company with an office in San Jose has a tracker. And the tracker basically is a thermal sensor. It's a smart label, smart label. And uh, this, as you probably know, that some medications when they need to be temperature controlled. Let's say you have a very uh, volatile chemical substance and it's going to be in a truck and it's going to be delivered in Nairobi. And, it's, and, and it can't go over 80 degrees Fahrenheit. And you know, not that I've been to Nairobi, but I can assure you there's probably 110 degrees inside of a truck in Nairobi, and that would kill that medication. So you need to make sure when you get that medication that you know that the medication has been within a certain temperature range. So this is part of what they have as their smart, their smart package tracking. Another big, big area that I see is environmental monitoring. There are a number, number of companies that are working on using this technology for making measurements, uh, low, low cost measurements, because one of the issues with uh, one of the features of this technology is that it's low cost. 
and to be able to use this technology to make measurements on environmental conditions, you know, pollution, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, disposables. This diapers, whether they be for children or adults with incontinence, it's important to know if a diaper is soiled because if, if a, an adult, especially an adult, has a soiled diaper, it could have some serious effects on creating wounds on their body. And especially when people that are elderly are bedridden, you need to make sure that their, their undergarments are clean all the time. And you can, in, you can embed these kinds of sensors woven into diapers or attached to diapers as a fabric. And those, those smart chemical sensors will indicate through Zigbee or some other wireless uh, functionality when that bed is wet or when that diaper is wet. Very important. We know that this is a big, big business. Personal health. Now the question is, how many people want to go through the time and effort to buy one of these and pay attention to what it says? That's going to be the challenge. And then the other one is food, beverage, and drug status monitoring. At UC Berkeley, uh, several of the people I talked to there are working on some sensors that will go into the cap of a milk container. So you have a milk container, you kind of screw off the cap, and you can determine whether or not that milk is spoiled without having to taste it, because there's a chemical sensor in that milk, milk uh, top. Interesting thing about how you make these sensors. You can make them in what is called batch mode. Batch mode is how they make integrated circuits on wafers. You know, it's like bang, 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 versus, con you know, discrete batch versus continuous roll where, like the Boston Globe or the New York Times, sensors are being made on roll-to-roll -roll configurations, meaning they're incredibly inexpensive because, just think of, a Boston Globe. How many pages are in a Boston Globe? And how much does a Boston Globe cost to make? We're New York Times. So this is going to be a really big opportunity, especially for sensors that are, are going to be large in format. Some of these sensors are going to be this large. You cannot get, what is it? Are we at 15 inches on the biggest silicon wafer right now? 15? Early, early on 15? Mr. Nothing, nothing in production. Mr. Mar yeah, like yeah. Okay. I saw, I, I was over at IMEC in, in yeah. Belgium and they showed me their new 15 yeah. facility. 12, 12 is out there, but 15, yeah. we're going to 15. Think of this versus that. Think of all the other, the area increase from here to here. And that's what you can get when you do a batch mode, but think of it as a, as a continuous piece of fabric. It's, it's just phenomenal. What, the cost of something like that could be. This is a very important slide. This tells the reason for the technology. And this was given to me by uh, my friend Paul Warbineth. And basically what it says is that there's a two order of magnitude difference between the base material of silicon, raw substrate, dollars per millimeter, and plastic and paper, two orders of magnitude. And, and one of my friends, uh, Janusz Brzyk, who's been writing about trillion sensors, has been talking about the importance of these kinds of, of platforms to be able to reduce the average selling price of the sensor down to pennies. And, and this is a vehicle by which it can be done. Batch manufacturing process these, these, this is from PST in South Africa. This machine costs less than $50,000. This machine came out of the University of Cape Town. This is a $50,000 machine. These people are making products out of this $50,000 machine. So again, barrier to entry is minimal. That's why this is such an exciting uh, opportunity. On the other hand, roll to roll, and it, there's a lot of really good work being done at UMass uh, Amherst and at UMass Lowell, where I will be on, uh, on Friday, where these rolls of, of uh, material will have the sensors printed on them. 
very inexpensive to make. The challenge is going to be resolution. How do you get how do you get how do you get the patterns to 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 fit on top of each other when you do multiple row uh, processing? And what's the line width resolution? Line width resolution is critical uh, criteria. Okay. So, um, based on the research that I conducted, it's become very apparent to me that certain areas of sensing modalities are being are much more advanced than others. And, and I'm in the process of putting together a paper to, to talk about this. But you can see this supplier landscape that I put together as a result of my uh, research. You can see how these different areas are populated. So if you look at force in touch, we'll show a couple of force in touch sensors that there's a lot of people doing force and touch. Why? Because it's easier to do force and touch. Where does it get really, really difficult is in areas like shock. I have talked to a lot of people to see if you can make an accelerometer, which is a mechanism that you can measure shock vibration, out of flexible materials. I haven't had anybody send me a, uh, a peer-reviewed paper for me to look at. So my feeling is this area here, if somebody, if somebody wants to do that, come up to me and let's talk about starting a company and I'd be happy to help you. So these are really important because if you look at wearables, wearables are so important because, uh, again, if you look at the um, Fitbit, Fitbit is basically measuring shock. It's measuring measuring your body hitting, uh, hitting uh, the pavement. And every time it hits pavement, that's a step. If you can make that very inexpensive silicon sensor, which is basically a one by one millimeter sensor uh, that costs less than a dollar, if you can make that in a flexible or weavable uh, modality, that will open up that marketplace immensely. Um, so you can, you can see, the, the other area here, and this is an area that Srinivas is, is expert in, is in the bio area. Uh, using, using this technology to be able to chemically determine the environment in which it's immersed, whether it be uh, you know, the work that uh, Ahmed Bilsnani is doing uh, or uh, others. This, is, this to me is a very, very big opportunity. And then another one is imaging. So I, as you, as you see, coming over here, this is where the opportunity for I think uh, new, uh, new, new research and, and new product development needs to focus. This area here is very much currently uh, mature. This is a good example. Isolog and, J and Grenoble. This is a, a spin-out of uh, CEA Leti, which is a big, big, big research facility over there, federally funded. And the thing that's really interesting is this is a batch mode process. When I talk to these people, they said we're not going to do roll-to-roll -roll because this is an expensive sensor and uh, we don't think we can make it in a roll-to-roll -roll process. They're going to do a 60 by 60 centimeter, which is like this big, batch mode. And these are going to go into uh, various applications, including hand print analysis. So you know you can do fingers, but I was told if you actually put a hand on a platter, the likelihood of you being able to to uh, fool the system is very very low versus putting a finger on a platter. So to try to do this in silicon would cost a fortune. But to do it in a piece of plastic makes this a much highly likely phenomena uh, for this to happen. So this, this is a very, very exciting, uh, one of the only optical sensors that I've seen made out of printed flexible technology. It's, it's in the market. Uh, Pressure Profiles LA company, this is one of many companies 
that, that does uh, 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 what I call a uh, force sensing array where they have plastic and they've embedded force sensing resistors that when you put pressure on the resistor, it changes its resistive value and by such, uh, or, or they use a capacitive, a capacitive approach when something is pressed, the capacitor, uh, di uh, the plate uh, distance changes and the plate distance change is linearly proportional to the, to the force. Lots of, lots of various applications for this. Uh, and um, and uh, medical devices, uh, uh, and automotive. This technology is used in, or has been used by a competing company in the seat of an automobile, which I call it. I call it the butt sensor, where you sit down on that sensor and it basically can determine where the person is sitting on that seat. So if the person is sitting on the seat and it's your grandmother and she weighs 90 pounds and she's sitting forward versus your uncle Bruno who weighs 400 pounds and is sitting in the back, that information goes into the smart deployment system of the airbag and tells that airbag how to deploy uh, from, a, from a, uh, deployment as a function of time point of view. Uh, so your grandmother doesn't get into the back seat. Technology is proven, it's on Volvos uh, for one vehicle. TechScan's a company here in Boston, over, over uh, uh, in uh, uh, South Boston area. They're using a, a, uh, a similar technology. The thing that's really interesting, I was over to talk to those guys last year when I was in town, and they have about a dozen patent disclosures on their wall dating back to 1990. This company has been doing this for, since 1990. They tend to be a small, a small supplier, and and they've been doing medical devices, sport, fitness, and ro robotic uh, applications. And what they've done here is again they have they have this film, and they put these um, uh, resistive um, uh, conductive conductive silver. Uh, pads on here, and based on the pressure on this pad, you get a signal. Uh, Sensing Techs, uh, Barcelona, and this is a company that's using using this material uh, in large in another large area ap ap application. Uh, so again, we're talking about. Uh, pressure and touch. We're not going to spend a lot of time on it, but just to show you, startup company, European. Uh, this this is a uh, an interesting company. Uh, it's uh, not very large, but you can see sensor sensing mats. Uh, sensing mats are used for people for gait analysis. In other words, you're walking, and people want to know how your how your force is being transmitted from the heel to the toes of your foot. And that's what TechScan is doing. They're doing a similar kind of thing. In other words, wearables. This is a wearable opportunity. As a research university, I think it's important to understand what's going on. And I think, uh, and I'm taking, uh, this information comes from a book, the National Academies Press, uh, book uh, that was uh, issued several years ago, and this was uh, one of the tables that I picked out of there. And this was kind of shocking to me, and, but not shocking, because I spent a lot of time in Europe, and, and I know that in Europe, the European Union is spending a lot of money on printed flexible sensors uh, research through organizations like the Fraunhofer and others, and we'll talk about that. The good news is, Uh, things are changing. Things are changing. Uh, here we have Northeastern, yay. That's uh, primarily with Ahmed, who's down here. But you can see, all, these are all the major players in Europe, and in, in, in each, each country has their own. France has a research group, Switzerland. Uh, Fraunhofer has 67 of these. IMEC uh, uh, in the Netherlands, and also in Belgium, VTT, and, and in Portugal also. Lots of money is being spent by the EU because they know 
that this is important. The two organizations I like to talk about here in the United States have recently been funded by the Department of Defense. Uh, one of them is in San Jose, called uh, Netflix, and the other one, uh, uh, and that's and they got 75 million from the Department of Defense, and they're they're going to be doing. Uh, paper plastic substrates. The other group over in Central Square in Cambridge, um, AFOA, Advanced Functional Fabrics of America, a MIT group, uh, and they're doing threads. I was over there uh, last year, very interesting, and, and both of these groups have a, an interesting role. They've gotten seed funding of 75 million from the government and they have a big network and and Mike Warren should be paying incredible attention to this of 250,000 dollars from industrial partners so with the seed money of 75 they've gone out and they said okay we want a whole bunch of people to be in our little coffee clutch and it's going to cost you X number of dollars to be members of this coffee clutch. And we're going to end up putting out all these markets, uh, all these uh, development programs, and you can be part of that, but you're going to be part of the coffee clutch. So that's what happens here, and that's what happens here. Now, I don't know if that's good or bad. All I know is I have lots of friends that are getting money from these companies, and I'm working on some very exciting things. I'm very excited about this group in, in uh, uh, Central Square. This is their network. They've got over, uh, unfortunately, North Ethan's not there yet. We're going to work on Nadine and others here to see if, if we can get them to be a member. But this is, the, this, this is who belongs here. And UMass Lowell and University of Massachusetts Amherst are two of the local folks that are doing this. And these people are doing a lot of very exciting, interesting uh, technologies in this fabric innovation network. And this is the facility that they have out in Cambridge. And uh, their objective is to create a national network of startup incubators and connect them together. So they're going to act kind of like as the maestro of the orchestra to get all this stuff to work together. Over 100 members to date. Nextflex in, in uh, Silicon Valley, uh, another 75 million with uh, 250 from industry and universities, and uh, UMass Lowell, uh, I think, has a major project from them. And this purpose here is to commercialize the technology. The same thing with AFOA. It's all about the key word here, manufacturing on printed flexible carriers. It's all about manufacturing. It's not about creating a new sensor. It's about creating a solution from that new sensor. How do you how do you package it? How do you make it work? How can it get into the marketplace from a robustness point of view? All hail Northeastern. This is what Ahmed's doing. And he's doing this up at the Burlington campus. And what he's done is, is he's put together a, a, a printing system that will do these sensors. And this, this sensing technology here is, you can see it's transparent. It has, it has the ability to make these measurements. Those measurements are really important physiological measurements. You, you, can, you can figure out a lot of things about a person's body with these, with these uh, uh, <coughs> different um, sensing modalities. This is this is the machine that uh, that Ahmed has put together. Uh, it is, uh, I think, uh, working with several uh, venture capitalists to uh, move into the marketplace. Uh, from a fabric point of view, I think that the people at North Carolina state are leading the charge. And the reason for that is that, as we may know, probably not because everybody here is too young, uh, fabric used to be made up in Lowell, Massachusetts. Right? Back in the early 1800s, Lowell was a mill town. 
there's still a whole bunch of mills up there, and I visited one last July. It's now a museum. And what's happened is that, because of several reasons, especially the cost of labor, mills moved down to the Carolinas because the cost of labor in the Carolinas was much less than it was in Lowell, Massachusetts. And then subsequent to that, offshore to Southeast Asia. North Carolina State has a program in fabric engineering. And as a result, they're doing some very exceptional work on multimodal multi multi sensors that are woven and those fabric elements are functionalized so they are sensitive to certain phenomena. And this, and I know that, that there are a couple of professors here at Northeastern that are doing this also, but I think the people here are uh, advanced in terms of their ability to create a solution. So this is a very exciting technology when you can see that a fabric can make uh, various measurements, uh, uh, for example, uh, dehydration measurements or temperature measurements. That's where we're going, making wear, wear, wearable platforms of sensors. So, uh, you know, lots and lots and lots and lots of words. The fact of the matter is, these people are leading the, uh, the charge. Our dear friend uh, uh, John Volakis, who has left Ohio State and is now at uh, Florida International University down in Miami, uh, uh, is a uh, major player uh, uh, to, in antennas. He's an, I'm an antenna guy. When I was an engineer, I designed antennas. And uh, John, I met John at the Sloan School a couple years ago when he was giving a paper. And the work that they're doing right now in in uh, Ohio State, and then he moved about six months ago down to Florida, was using fabrics to create antennas. When you really think of it, an antenna can be, pr and I designed these when I was a co-op student here. I, designing an antenna, you can make an antenna on a two-dimensional substrate. You can, you can make a bow tie antenna uh, on a piece of substrate, and, and that could, uh, uh, radiate uh, an antenna pattern. And what he's doing is he's, he's functionalizing fabrics and making antennas out of these functionalized fabrics. Think about this. If you're at the Natick Labs, the U.S. Army Natick Labs, you can actually put an antenna into an Army uniform and have that person being able to radiate out signals from, let's say, their their scope uh, to determine where uh, enemy infiltration has occurred, and nobody has to carry, like in World War II, they had a big, a big antenna sticking out of the back of somebody's back. This is something that you can wear on your person. So this is another really important opportunity. Instead of having, instead of having a physical antenna, you have a woven antenna, which makes a wearable and a movable IoT uh, realizable. Some, you know, some, some more, some more uh, uh, of what he's doing. So I think, you know, we only have a couple more minutes left, and I'm going to move forward. There's a lot of work being done. This is a very important slide. The European Union has has put a lot of money into the concept of integration. Fraunhofer in Munich uh, is working on a project uh, that is creating a laminated system, as I talked about earlier. And what they've determined here is what things can be done in fabric and what things can't be done in fabric. And as time's going on over there, they're coming to the point where they're creating a system and optimizing the performance of the system based on its uh, substrate uh, requirement. And uh, so, uh, so also, so also in uh, uh, Fraunhofer in Berlin. Moving forward, 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 forward. All this, you can get this stuff. Uh, so I talked about system integration. Uh, the key to the success of the commercialization of this technology 
is can you make it? Can you make it inexpensively? Can you make it so it won't fail? Those are the three things that you have to look at. The other thing that's really a challenge is how do you model these things? How do you use various modeling pro profiles that take into effect materials, material behavior, how materials work under certain environmental conditions to determine whether or not these interfaces that you design will sustain certain environmental conditions. I have several friends that are in this business and there's still a lot of modeling challenges that, that, are, that have to be overcome. So that's, that's, that's one of the barriers that I, I see to this. The other, the other re real interesting thing is this one right here. People are, over time, are going to determine exactly which technologies have to be made in a discrete fashion, like an accelerometer, and which ones can be made in a printed woven. And that's going to determine what the system will look like, similar to there. Now, what kinds of sensors are we going to be able to put here, and will they be? <coughs> Fabric sensors, film sensors, or discrete silicon sensors? Big, big challenge. It's a systems integration challenge, as I see it. Critical success factors. I think there needs to be a great deal of marketing research conducted here to determine where these technologies can be optimally used to solve problems. In other words, it's not, it's not what I call inverse marketing. You've got the solution, look for an application. We have to understand where applications are, like wearables, what needs to be measured, dehydration. Dehydration is very important. It's not just for people that are running the marathon. Elderly people, pregnant women, have major dehydration problems, from what I'm told. And being able to wear some kind of a dehydration system to let you know that you need to put some kind of fluids in your bodies, electrolytes, et cetera, et cetera, is critical. And, uh, and um, you know, I, I make this statement here, as go printed flexible electronics and functional fabrics, so go the sensors that will support those technologies. And unless those organizations like AFOA and Flex really do some earth-shattering work to bring the industries together, we're not going to be successful. A lot is riding on that. How to make money in this, this uh, program? I said this earlier, it's not by providing sensors, it's by providing solutions. You have to understand the role of the sensor in an overall product, and you need to figure out all the things that go around the sensor that will make a solution and an application viable. And one of the ways to do that is if you're a startup company, is you gotta look for partners. Partners, if you have a great sensor, you need to find a company that does roll-to-roll -roll printing. Uh, and um, caveat for, for people in the sales and marketing business, understanding the unique benefits of what these technologies bring to a solution, and that's how you get designed into a product. Summary conclusion. Hopefully we're not making you late for your uh, uh, linear active circuits class. Um, great growth, great opportunities. Wearables are going to lead the charge. Um, it's not going to be a technology push strategy. It's going to be an applications pull strategy. Looking at where there needs to be a measurement made of a certain phenomena, whether it be a chemical phenomena to determine urine or whatever it is, needing to go out and talk to the voice of the customer in the industry and understand what is needed and then try to figure out how this technology will optimally solve that problem. Again, 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 sports fitness disposables, package tracking, uh, I, I think are the big opportunities here. And these are some of the companies that I really like. Uh, as we do on nightly business report, I have to give you full, full disclosure, I do not own any of the stock in those companies. But I, I'm really a fan of ISOG. I really think that their optical sensing technology is unique and, and uh, there's not a lot of people that uh, 
can do that. There's a company out in, um, that used to be in Somerville where I grew up and now they're in Lexington. It's called MC10. It's based on a lot of work that was done by a University of Illinois professor that has moved to a Northwestern, John Rogers, and it's all about chemical sensing. They've got a really interesting technology right now that they've sold to L'Oreal, the French cosmetic company, that comes on a L'Oreal uh, package, and you put this on your skin, and it tells you when your sun level is reached a certain level, so people that have light complexions don't get burnt, uh, burnt up. So th that's a very high volume application based on John Rogers' uh, technology. And then film, film the company out in Silicon Valley with headquarters up in and, uh, Norway, I really think that, that, that their technology is uh, very commercialized and will go uh, far. Uh, I've written several articles. Uh, so they're on my website. If you want them, you can get them. Uh, those are the references. We won't go into the details. Uh, some upcoming events. Uh, as we speak, as we speak over at Berlin, uh, there's going to be a printed flexible conference. Uh, uh, the, WEAR, the WEAR conference in New York City, where I will be, is going to talk a lot about this technology and how sensors can be used in wearables. Uh, uh, sensors Expo, I'm having an all-day um, uh, printed flexible uh, session there. Uh, we'll have 14 speakers, including the uh, chief marketing officer at AFOA. Uh, at Comms in Montrose, Switzerland, there's going to be a session on printed flexible, and 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 this is a very important conference here in Santa Clara uh, in November, uh, probably the largest single uh, printed flexible uh, conference and trade show in the world. So that's that, and thank you, thank you, thank you. Hopefully, I haven't made you late. If there are questions and you don't have to rush off to another class, I'm happy to answer them. I don't have another appointment for a while. And uh, questions are encouraged. Thank you, Roger. So, who has a burning question? The editors have to have burning there, questions. There, yeah. <laughs> Perhaps there's some of the slides they skipped over, questions. but have typical consideration to uh, using uh, visual information. For instance, on that gate analysis, have you had a connect sensor right there? Depth in RGB. Depth in the, uh, if I can understand your question properly, when you do this gate analysis, like tech scan guys, and by the way, I forgot to mention this. Thank you for bringing this up. There's going to be a webinar, and I'm going to have the tech scan guy on this webinar that's going to promote this all day conference at Census Expo. So, what, what do they do over at, at the tech scan? I can actually have you put consideration just to using visual uh, modalities because you mentioned chemical modalities. Just to kind of yeah, but the, the people that I saw, the, the people that I saw basically have a mechanism where they're doing IR detection using uh, using uh, a uh, an IR detector and transmitter on a plastic-based substrate. So they're one of the only people that I know of. You know, if you go back to that that uh, that. Uh, list way back here, that big matrix that I showed, that answers your question right there. Imaging. Those two and people. And they're mixing it with the other modalities? So they're, they're using No. These, these two people, to the best of my knowledge, are just using single modality uh, IR imaging strategies. They're not using it uh, in conjunction with other things. However, however, what could happen is if you have a system, envision a system where you have multiple inputs to a microprocessor and you end up getting a whole bunch of inputs and then going into the microprocessor and working with the algorithms in the microprocessor and artificial intelligence to determine exactly what's going on out there, you can get six or seven different modalities including optical modality to determine what's going on. So it could work, but I don't know if anybody that's doing it. I'm not saying it doesn't exist, but I'm not aware of it. But any of, any of these modalities can be used with another in a system where you have what is called sensor fusion. Yeah. Sensor fusion basically will work with multiple 
sensor inputs into a base system that has a microcontroller in there and algorithms to be able to go and sample all that information and put them into some equation to determine some phenomenon. Yeah. Yeah, we did a collection study that captures five modalities, being gene being the only non-visual, but we haven't seen that, heard anything about these um, sensor uh, fabrics. It's just interesting. Well, it, you know, the fabrics are, uh, the fabrics are moving slowly. Uh, there's a company called Sensoria who's just accepted my invitation to speak at Sensors Expo, uh, and they've got they've got uh, sensors and socks. Mm. I've seen I've seen I've seen this at that ID Texas thing where they have these sensors that are uh, um, functional fabric uh, wound around a basic fa uh, fabric like a. Uh, thread wound around a basic fabric, and those threads are functionalized and are able to determine temperature and, uh, I think, uh, pressure. So as time goes on, the modalities are increasing, increasing, and the challenge is how do you, how do you use the sensor modalities to solve a measurement problem? That's the key element. Problem, solution. What's the solution? whole bunch of sensors to be able to accurately assess a problem, right? The sensors are out there. The question is, how do you integrate them? How do you take the data and transform it into information vis-a-vis -vis an intelligence, i.e. microcontroller function? Mm -hmm. Another question? Thank you. Pleasure. Yes. Uh, one question. Uh, when we put a sensor on a microcontroller, on a roll-up paper or plastic, have they uh, transferred the data to some microcontroller or microprocessor? Oh, um, well, that's a very good question. And, the, and that's kind of where I talked about integration and packaging and interconnects. So the thing is, let's, you, the, the real weak point in the chain here is how do you get the signal out of, let's say, here, an array, an array of sensors, how do you get the signals out of here? Well, basically, you have to kind of, it's almost like a PC board. You know, it's an analogous to a PC board. You basically have all these sensors, and they have all these wire interconnects, you know, um, and they all come to the edge, just, just like a PC board, or, or just like an integrated circuit, right? You've got an integrated circuit, all these, all these things come to the edge, and then they fit into a connector. So the real challenge is, you know, in a piece in, in an IC, this is easy, right? Because all that stuff is inside the IC. You know, you you get all you know, get the silicon, you get the wires, you get the bond pads, you get the tabs. But all of a sudden, and why is that? Because you're not sensing the environment. You're just comp computing things. When you have a sensor, you need to have the un the functionality in contact with the media that you want to measure. And the challenge is, how do you convert something that's exposed to media into something that goes into an electronic function? In other words, it's a, uh, an IC is a single modality situation, electronic to electronic. Sensors are basically multi, uh, multi. You, you know, you might have a chemical sensor that comes out electrically. You might have a mechanical sensor. So there's multiple modality issues, and when you have those, the connectivity issues become really, really significant. Yeah, sort of related to that, there's an organization called IPC. It was once the Institute for Printed Circuits, but they don't use that anymore. But they are developing standards for connectivity for, um, for um, uh, smart textiles. So that's, uh, I don't have the specific website, but it's just ipc.org, and then you could drill down and find more on, on, on what they're doing, but it's standardization. For, now, uh, th thank you for bringing that up, because one of the things I didn't mention as part of commercialization is standards. I have, I've been doing something since 1998, this is the 20th year that I'm doing it, it's called the Commercialization Report Card, and I've determined that there are like 14 critical success factors to create you know, those MEMS, to bring MEMS from that technology to the world. And one of them was standards. And without standards, it gets really hard to commercialize technology. 
And one of the things that I didn't bring out here in terms of a commercialization challenge is how will standards be introduced, like Rick mentioned, into functional fabrics and, and other kinds of technologies so that the industry kind of works collaboratively and makes it easy for the user to adopt the technology because a lot of people that are in these technologies don't want standards because all of a sudden they feel that their intellectual property is going to be exposed and they'll lose their competitive advantage. So that's been a real problem with standards in MEMS. For example, I wrote an article not too long ago about standards in MEMS. There were over 950 standards that the Semiconductor Equipment and Materials International people have supported for semiconductor processing. There are only six MEMS. Now that is really severe, right? Because MEMS people don't really want to collaborate. They're kind of still kind of renegades of the wild, wild west kind of people. They're not, they, they don't want to let anybody else know, and that's why there's been a problem with standards, and I think that's one of the reasons why this men's business has been so slow to evolve. It's like 125th or 130th the size of the semiconductor industry, and they only started 10 years apart from each other, 1955 versus 1945. So, so standards are really critical, and, and um, I'm going to have to look into what you said because that, that's important that these, these uh, industry people work collaboratively. Mark, do you have a they're, they're working with the uh, AM, whatever. I forget. Yeah, 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 they follow people. Or, or part Mark, of the, Mark, you always have good questions. Come on. <laughs> Stump the chump, Mark. Come Stump on. Stump the chump. Stump the chump. <laughs> Maybe later. Okay, bye. I have a question downstream about commercialization, staying on that theme. What's the role of reuse and recycling, given that the, the larger volumes of, of, of material, right? That's a very good question. The answer is, I haven't really looked into it. Uh, but it has to be looked into. And, 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 and when you start thinking about, good example, batteries. People are looking at this technology to do batteries, right? All of a sudden, we know what happens. Like, uh, you know, in my, in my kitchen drawer at home, I get a bag. What do I do with that bag? I put batteries in it. When I go to my favorite battery store, I bring my batteries and I go, here's a present for you. I'm not going to throw these batteries in the, in the garbage, right? We all have to be responsible people. So that's going to be part, and that's kind of, I think, part of the standards issue and, and part of the industry issue of how do, how do we be responsible to the ecosystem, not only to provide solutions, but to make sure that we're not challenging it. Good question. I need to include that. Thank you. So we have quite some materials uh, option, like the stretchable silicon polymers and maybe 2D materials for the printed electronic devices. From the material point of view, in your opinion, which materials are better for those uh, you know, future printed flexible devices? Well, you know, one of the things really is, it's a very, another very good question, and I'm, I'm trying to put together uh, some work that will define that. One of the things that we should keep in mind is, if you look at a semiconductor, uh, and, and we, know, we know that semiconductors are driven by line widths, right? The node, the node. And the performance and the, and the size of a semiconductor is driven by the line width. So it's been determined so far, based on the, and I mentioned this, the printing techniques, that the printing techniques right now only can provide a certain level of line width and resolution and spacing. That's going to dictate the ability uh, of the performance of this. What's happening right now is to achieve flexibility. They're taking a standard wafer and they're thinning it. They're going and they're thinning these wafers down using chemical, uh, mechanical uh, grinding and processing. So you can actually get a silicon wafer. And I've seen this over in, in Berlin, where you, where, you can wrap, where you can wrap this eight inch wafer around your wrist like this, and there's no cracks in it. So there's going to be areas where you can still use printed flexible, but to consider it as a cost viable situation, it costs a lot of money to do all that chemical, mechanical milling and processing. So I think what's going to happen here is, as I mentioned earlier, 
there's a whole bunch of technologies that can be used, that can be created in paper and in plastic, and there will, for example, accelerometers. I haven't seen any accelerometers yet. So accelerometers, the only way you're going to get around accelerometers is have a one-by-one one accelerometer that's going to probably be pretty thin, and you're going to have to attach that to here with bond wires. Because, and that's what the people over in Europe are doing with that group, Fraunhofer in Munich. They're looking at the trade-offs of how to integrate various functionalities into a system to determine exactly what the platform for that system solution is. Did that answer your question? Kind of. Yeah, thank you. Okay. So flexible printed circuits have been around for a long time. Are there any of the techniques or processes that are used in flexible printed circuits that can be applied here? Great question, Martin. That's, that's a stump to stump to jump question. <laughs> Um, let's say this, I am not an expert on, on those technologies. Uh, however, I, I would think, being an engineer, and just kind of thinking outside the box here, a lot of the conductivity issues have to be there. If you have a, flex, if you have a flexible, uh, uh, what, what's the basic flexible circuit substrate material? Uh, well, it's usually copper with uh, you know, some kind of plastic what, 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 what's the what's the base material? Uh, PDF. Man, I think it's been such a long time since I've been in it, but it was yeah. usually it was uh, some kind of mylar. Or something. Yeah, mylar. Yeah. yeah. So if you have mylar, let's say we have mylar, uh, and and you want to uh, say here. My my screen cleaner. Okay, let's say, let's say that this has a whole bunch of sensors in it. I think the technology that, to, to answer Martin's question, this is a platform. This is not a silicon piece of silicon, right? right? What needs to be looked at here is the interface between the outside world and the inside world. And I think there could be a lot learned on how to get the signal in to the signal out. That's bottom line. How do you take the signal that's on the circuit, circuit's here, a whole bunch of functions, off to the edge, how does this thing go outside to be usable? It has to go outside to be usable, right? With, you know, it, 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 whether it goes on to another chip or whether it, it goes on to a printed circuit antenna that's embodied in the package itself, consider something like this, and it's a laminate. Let's say it's a laminate and this is this is like, and this is what's being done at Fraunhofer. They're laminating different modalities, and they're doing things like TSV, uh, uh, vias through silicon, and they're basically packaging these things in, mul in multiple layers, and the layers are compatible with the technologies that are going to be on that layer. So you have a multi-layered solution, and then all of that gets put into package and that package basically gets sent off. Roger, 17 minutes over. <laughs> <laughs> lots, lots of questions. All right. Presentation in the wrong time. Don't give me the wrong time. All right. So if you still have any questions, I think you're here for tomorrow. You didn't want to go to linear circuits 101 because it was very boring. <laughs> Yeah, everything is nonlinear and flexible. Oh, wait a are, they, are we holding up your class? Are these, guys, are these boys and girls in your yeah, class? Yeah, sure. See, that's it. They're in your all class. Right. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you all for attending. Thank you. So, gentlemen, thank you. So, let's thank let's talk a little bit now, and then we'll do some telephone follow-ups on okay, how we yeah. can convert a whole bunch of this information into what we're going to do here. Roger, you're missing lunch as well. If you're not yeah. going to be fast. <laughs> okay. okay. I'm going to go to some meetings. I just want to say hi.